1 Corinthians chapter 12. And now, brothers, I want to write about the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives to each of you, for I don't want any misunderstanding about them. You will remember that before you became Christians, you went around from one idol to another, not one of which could speak a single word. But now you are meeting people who claim to speak messages from the Spirit of God. How can you know whether they are really inspired of God or whether they are fakes? Here is the test. No one speaking by the power of the Spirit of God can curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord and really mean it unless the Holy Spirit is helping him. Now God gives us many kinds of special abilities, but it is the same Holy Spirit who is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service to God, but it is the same Lord we are serving. There are many ways in which God works in our lives, but it is the same God who does the work in and through all of us who are his. The Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping the entire church. To one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Someone else may be especially good at studying and teaching, and this is his gift from the same Spirit. He gives special faith to another and to someone else the power to heal the sick. He gives power for doing miracles to some and to others power to prophesy and preach. He gives someone else the power to know whether evil spirits are speaking through those who claim to be giving God's message or whether it is really the Spirit of God who is speaking. Still another person is able to speak in languages he never learned, and others who do not know the language either are given power to understand what he is saying. It is the same and only Holy Spirit who gives all these gifts and powers, deciding which each one of us should have. Our bodies have many parts, but the many parts make up only one body when they are all put together. So it is with the body of Christ. Each of us is a part of the one body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But the Holy Spirit has fitted us all together into Christ's body, into one body. We have been baptized into Christ's body by the one Spirit and have all been given that same Holy Spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And what would you think if you heard an ear say, I am not part of the body because I'm only an ear and not an eye? Would that make it any less a part of the body? So suppose the whole body were an eye, then how would you hear? Or if your whole body were just one big ear, how could you smell anything? But that isn't the way God has made us. He has made many parts for our bodies and has put each part just where he wants it. What a strange thing a body would be if it had only one part. So he has made many parts, but still there is only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And some of the parts that seem weakest and least important are really the most necessary. Yes, we're especially glad to have some parts that seem rather odd, and we carefully protect from the eyes of others those parts that should not be seen, while of course the parts that may be seen do not require this special care. So God has put the body together in such a way that extra honor and care are given to those parts which might otherwise seem less important. This makes for happiness among the parts, so that the parts have the same care for each other that they do for themselves. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Now here is what I'm trying to say, all of you together are the one body of Christ, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. Here is a list of some of the parts he has placed in his church, which is his body. Apostles, prophets, those who preach God's word, teachers, those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who can get others to work together, 
Those who speak in languages they've never learned. Is everyone an apostle? Of course not. Is everyone a preacher? No. Are all teachers? Does everyone have the power to do miracles? Can everyone heal the sick? Of course not. Does God give all of us the ability to speak in languages we've never learned? Can just anyone understand and translate what those are saying who have that gift of foreign speech? No. But try your best to have the more important of these gifts. First, however, let me tell you about something else that is better than any of them. Then follows the great chapter on love. Now, I have had for the sake of peace to come to an agreement with my children that I will not use any more personal illustrations from family life. So I will begin in general terms and must say that some children, when their father gets home from a journey, say, we're so glad to see you, Daddy, and look at his luggage with a fixed stare. Some children do. I acknowledge freely that we've got to the point in our household where daddy borrows money from the children. <laughs> but what are fathers for if not to give? That is their nature. They are there to provide for every need of their children. And God in heaven is a father. So one would expect him to have a generous nature to earn that title, father. And indeed, we have a God who gives and who gives and who gives again and never stops giving. This day is a gift of his grace. There are four primary needs of human nature. I alliterate them so you can remember them, but your four biggest needs are pardon, peace, purpose, and power. And God gave his only son so that you might have all those four things. And at Christmas, we remember the greatest gift of all, his son. But when he died on a cross, God gave you pardon. When he rose from the dead, his first word to his disciples was peace. When he ascended into heaven, he gave those men a purpose that would consume their whole life, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to observe what I've commanded. But on the day of Pentecost, he gave them the fourth power. And it's that that I wish to speak about this morning. Power. One of the difficulties, I believe, in our relationship to the Lord is that we are far too general and vague. Our prayers are too general and vague. We say, Lord, bless me. And I'm sure the Lord wants to reply, well, what kind of blessing? Lord, grant me all that, my, all that I need. Well, what do you need? Lord, help me to love the world. Well, which person in the world do you find it difficult to love? And the Lord wants to get us down to the particular. The old Puritans used to have a favorite saying, descend to the particular. Don't deal in genera generalities. Don't say, Lord, forgive all my sins. Say, Lord, forgive this and that and the other. To be specific is so much deeper a relationship. And when we pray on Whit Sunday, Lord, give your church power, the Lord is saying, well, what sort of power? What particular demonstration of power? Lord, give us all you've got. Well, I know I've got everything, says the Lord, but what part of what I've got are you anxious to have? There is a place for holy ambition in the Christian life. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is an all-encompassing gift of power, breaks up then into particular gifts of the Spirit, which we then appropriate as examples of that power. And this morning in treating 1 Corinthians 12 rather than Acts 2, I'm treating the particular gifts within the overall gift. On the day of Pentecost, the overall gift of the Spirit came in power. But from then on, it is particular gifts that are manifested. There was one gift manifested straight away, a few days later there was another and then a third, as we shall see in going on with our studies in the life of Simon Peter this evening. And so we're going to talk about the particular gifts, the specifics. And I hope that before I finish speaking this morning, every one of you will have a passion, a desire for at least one of these gifts that you may pass it on to the body of Christ. We have some visitors from South Africa here this morning. Welcome to you in the name of the Lord. 
And my mind goes back to my days at Cambridge when I sat one day in my study and I was next door to a South African student called Donald who'd come over to study theology and he came into my study and he had a pair of the most beautiful hand knitted socks which lasted me a very long time and he gave them to me and he said uh, here you are here's a present and I said well what's this for and he said well it's my birthday oh I said I'm so sorry I should have had something for you I didn't know it was your birthday. No, he said, that's all right. My mother always brought us up to give things away on our birthdays. So she sent me a dozen pair of socks. And here are yours. What a mother! What a mother! And she was a perfect reflection of a heavenly father. Because when God gives gifts, he doesn't give them for you. In all the gifts mentioned in this chapter, there's only one that would be of any help to you personally. All the rest are given to you to pass on. What an ambition it is to have a gift that you may give to someone else to build up the body of Christ. And so all his gifts have this character about them that they're simply given to you to pass on. You're the channel. That's all. Well, now there are many basic questions we're going to tackle this morning about particular gifts of the Spirit. But the first thing I want to do is to distinguish carefully between natural and spiritual gifts. Though God gave them both, and though he demands an account of how they're both used, they are distinct things. Natural gifts are possessed by unbelievers. Your natural gifts you had before you came to Christ. When you came to Christ, you put yourself on the altar, you put your natural gifts on the altar. And praise God when you did. There are natural gifts like music, organization, finance, knocking a nail in straight with a hammer. Uh, just think of your natural gifts. And God wants those. And when the Lord bought you, he bought those gifts as well. And they belong to him and they're to be used for him. But spiritual gifts are rather different. Spiritual gifts are given to believers, not to unbelievers. It's as if God has a special treasure store for his family. Of abilities that he wants to add to those already possessed. Or it may even be that you feel like one of these with only one little talent and you've buried it because you've only one and other people have ten and you can leave it all to them anyway. And so you've buried what little natural gift you had. God wants to add gifts to those who don't have natural gifts. As long as the church relies on people with natural gifts, it will rely on 10% of the population for its leadership. And it will be thoroughly middle class and middle aged. But when the church realizes that God wants to distribute his gifts without favor, and that in fact he rather loves to give gifts to the poor, to those who don't have much to offer him, he loves to give them something to offer back. And so we're looking at spiritual gifts this morning, which are given not to unbelievers, but to believers. Given to those who can receive his spirit, whom the world doesn't know and can't receive. Abilities to do something for other people that will build up the church of Christ on earth. And isn't it exciting to be part of a church that's growing faster today than it's grown in 2,000 years? The church is not dying out. Well, now we look first at the inspiration of these gifts because it is, alas, a sad fact that for every gift of the Spirit there is at the same time a human substitute and a satanic counterfeit. And what appear as gifts can in fact not be gifts from the Lord himself. It is vital when gifts are being given that we use the mind that God has given us to examine the content of those gifts. It is fatal to decide whether they are genuine or not on the basis of pure emotion. And that's why Paul warns very seriously, remember that in your pagan days you could be profoundly moved by dumb idols who couldn't say a word. And you can be moved emotionally by pagan religion. Just a few months back I was visiting some Buddhist temples in Thailand. And I was moved emotionally. I wasn't moved near a god, but I was moved. The color and the whole atmosphere of them was out of this world. It was meant to be. And I was moved. But it didn't move me in the right direction. It simply moved my feelings, my aesthetic response. And it's terribly important to realize that pagan religion can move people deeply. 
people dabbling in the occult today are being moved. Alas, they are sometimes finding more reality than there are in Orthodox Christianity, and that's why they go there. But they can be moved. And the world counts reality today as that which moves them emotionally. There is an existential approach to reality which judges reality by the emotions. And Paul says, remember, you were moved by dumb idols. They couldn't even speak. But you were profoundly moved in the depths of your being, but you were not being moved towards God. And there had to come a day when you turned away from these idols to the living God. So mere emotion is not the test. You can be led astray by your emotions. You can be moved by a human spirit, by a spirit of excitement or hysteria or a crowd that is not the Spirit of God moving you. How do you know when the Spirit of God is moving and giving gifts? The first thing is this. Jesus Christ will be acknowledged as sovereign Lord and everything will be under his control. To say Jesus is Lord is not to recite a creed. It's to put yourself under a new management. It's to say he's in charge. And anything that doesn't lift up the Lord Jesus and put him on the throne and put my life under his control is not of the Holy Spirit. It may be of the flesh, it may be of the devil, but it's not of the Holy Spirit. Let me take one example. Spiritual healing, faith healing can be of three sorts. It can come from God. Praise God when it does. I'll tell you more tonight, I think, about the way the Lord has ministered to the cancer in my wife through a two-month-old Christian in the last week. There's a healing that comes from God. There's a healing that comes from the human spirit which is based on suggestion and suggestibility. And there's a healing that comes from Satan which heals the body and damns the soul. There's a spiritist healing center not many miles from here where this is happening every day. How important it is to be able to recognize now all three may move you deeply but one is of God and the other two are not. Where Jesus is Lord and where people recognize that spontaneously and say it, then you know the Holy Spirit of God is moving. A friend of mine is in business with a retired army officer down in southwest of England. And the army officer is not a Christian, my friend is. And the army officer's wife went to a spirit of seance, began to get involved in this thing, and really got caught up, and she was profoundly moved by it all. And the husband was worried stiff. He would have nothing to do with it. And he said to my friend, how can I get her away from this? How can I break the power it seems to have? And my friend said, well, one thing the spirits will never say is Jesus is Lord. And so this army officer, not a believer, went with his wife to the next meeting. She was thrilled. And then the medium went into a trance and invited questions or inquiries from the other side. And this army officer was asked, do you want to ask anything? And he said, yes, I would just like to ask, is Jesus Lord? And the medium opened her mouth, and out of her mouth came the most horrible blasphemies and obscenities. And this army officer said, in all my army days, I never heard such foul language. And people got up and were running for the door, and his wife got up and went out, and she said, I'm never coming back again. And it broke the power. No man says Jesus is Lord. Except the Holy Ghost is saying it's through his lips. Have you ever noticed that only people who have the Spirit in their hearts say, Lord? Plenty of people believe in God. They use all kinds of epithets for him. The man upstairs, him up there. You, I've heard it all. But I never hear an unbeliever say, the Lord. Do you? I hear Jesus used in God's spell, superstar, I see his name on the advertisements, but when do you see the word Lord, apart from a believer? The glorious thing is that when the Holy Spirit is giving gifts, you'll hear from people's lips, Lord, Lord, and that acknowledges that he is boss and that he's in control, and that therefore these gifts are not given to me to control myself, they're given to me to submit back to him and ask him how he wants me to use them. So there's the first test of the reality of God's Spirit moving among people. The second is that gifts of the Spirit will always have about them the character of God himself. In other words, they will always be a combination of variety and unity. God himself is that combination. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Father is not the same as the Son, and the Son is not the same as the Spirit. But there is a unity between them so that when you talk to any of the three, you feel you're talking to all three. 
You don't feel you need to talk to one and then get the other on your side or play off one against another. That's why it's an academic problem to me as to who you should pray to. People ask me, should you pray to the Father or to Jesus? Well, I pray to both and I pray to the Spirit. Some people have told me I'm not theologically sound if I do, but I'm praying to a wonderful unity, a variety in unity. And so we look at nature, as I've said many times, and we see variety in unity. There aren't two blades of grass the same, no two snowflakes the same, no two grains of sand the same, no two stars the same, but it's a universe. And if God is like this in himself, and if nature is like this in creation, how much more true will it be of redemption? And within the people of God, when the Spirit is moving, there will be a delightful variety within unity. God doesn't like uniformity. He doesn't like sameness. And the gifts he'll give will be different. A great variety of things will happen when God is moving. We were talking last Sunday night, no, Sunday night before, about ritualism and ritualism and all the other isms that, that get us in the same routine. So that God must be weary with our worship, weary with the same old words and the same old routine. God is a God of variety, and therefore there are many kinds of service, but it's the one God. There are many ways of working out the power that he works in, but it's the same Lord. And even the Trinity is mentioned here as variety and unity, and this will be expressed and reflected. When the gifts of the Spirit are given, there's lovely variety, lovely variety. Alas, we don't always welcome or appreciate that variety. But however many gifts there are, they're all from the same source, they're for the same person, and they will be operating under the same plan. Now at this point, the author of this letter, Paul writes down twelve or nine such gifts, rather nine such gifts. It's not an exhaustive list, there are others in Romans 12, there are others in Ephesians 4, and scattered through the rest of the scripture you'll find still others. Do you know what I believe was the main gift given at Pentecost? Boldness. Go through the early chapters of Acts and underline the word boldness. I believe that was one of the main gifts of the Spirit at Pentecost and it's a gift desperately needed today, but there are many others. As I look through this list of gifts of the Spirit, I'm struck with this fact that five out of nine are gifts of speech. The one way that God chooses to operate in our world is through speech. The world is sick of words. We have too many words from the world. We are disillusioned with both the quantity and quality of the words of men. It's talk talk, rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. <clears throat> That's the words of men. But God uses language supremely as his channel of power. He looked at nothing and he said, let there be light, and there was light. He just had to say the word and it was as good as done. And that's why most of the things that happen in his church happen through speech, through words. That's why we still believe in preaching. People say we're wasting our time. The church should get busy with its hands and do something. Woe betide the day when we listen to that half-truth of the devil. It's a half-truth. We are to use our hands. But God wants us to use our mouths as much as anything to build up his church. Not just to save the unconverted, but to build each other up. How much power you have in your mouth. As I prayed this morning about this service and about you, I was given one sentence which I have to pass on to one member of this congregation this morning. Just caught sight of them. So glad they're here because I have that one word from God to pass on. And I know that since he gave it to me, that one word is going to be God's power for that person in their need at this time. And I just praise him that he gave me a gift of one sentence to give to one person here this morning. Just one. The power of words. And so God's gifts of the Spirit are invariably gifts of speech. We have in our congregation this morning, and what a privilege it is, we have Dr. Kenneth Taylor. I can't just see where he is. He's going to speak to us in a moment. Here's his Bible. There he is right in front. One praises God for three quarters of a million words that he has written, and God is using that word. We have also about a dozen or more translators who are working at living translations elsewhere in the world. There's power in words, not in the words of men, but in the word of God. And so there are many gifts of speech. The first gift mentioned is not the gift of wisdom, but the gift of a word of wisdom. 
The gift of opening your mouth. Oh Lord, deliver us from lockjaw. Lord, set the silent saints free to speak so that when we meet each other, we've got a gift from God to pass on through the mouth that will build up his church, strengthen the believers, and glorify his name. And so five out of nine of these gifts are gifts of speech. And if I'm not willing to let my mouth go, if I'm not willing to have my tongue serve the Lord, then there are many gifts that will not get passed on. It's not just the pulpit I'm talking about now, I'm speaking about the body of Christ. And if we are not ready to open our mouths, then we're going to hold up God's work. What an exciting thing, however, that my tongue, which has been used by Satan, and which is the most difficult part of my body to control, and in fact it's shaped like a Roman sword, a two-edged broad sword is exactly the shape of the human tongue, and how we can use it to slay and to kill and to hurt. It can hurt much deeper than a fist, and it's set on fire by hell, and if you ever meet a man who never says the wrong thing, you've met a perfect man, says the Bible. And if you never say the wrong thing, you are perfect, and you don't need any more sanctification. Hallelujah, if you are. But there are two ways of misusing your tongue, and we often think of one wrong way and think that's the exclusive list of tongue sins. We think of saying wrong things, but more of us, I believe, in the people of God sin with our tongues by keeping our tongue quiet. I think we hurt more people by not speaking when we might have done by not passing on to them a word from God. And so the God who said, let there be light, says, I want your tongue, this most difficult member, it's a tiny thing, it's as tiny as a little rudder on a big ship or a spark causing a forest fire. But oh, if I had your tongue. I believe that is why on the day of Pentecost, the first bit of those 120 men and women that the, the Holy Spirit got hold of was the tongue. If he can get hold of that, he can deal with anything else. If you will render him the total control of your tongue, then he'll have no job with your hands or your feet, no difficulty with anything else. But it's often the last bastion of our personality. We're frightened to let the tongue go because we fear it may reveal things. We're reserved and polite with each other for fear that people guess what's inside. And so we keep the conversation impersonal. And God says, give me your tongue. Let me give you gifts so that you can pass on to others that which will build up. If I run through these gifts, it is only just to remind you what they are. Solomon had the word of wisdom. Solomon was a man who talked in his sleep, but he prayed. That's important. Do you pray in your sleep? Solomon did. He was fast asleep when he said, Lord, give me wisdom. And the next day he was in a situation that any self-respecting man would run a million miles away from. Two women quarreling over one baby. Can you imagine any situation more fraught with peril for the men? But oh, what wisdom. Bring me a sword. Let's cut, cut the baby in two. As soon as he said that, he found out the real mouth. There was a situation not long ago where I found myself in a similar spot at a very much lesser degree. But there were three girls in a, a college of education in London. And there were such close friends, they all led the Christian Union together, that when they left, finished college, they decided that they would all three marry and live together. And so one day, six people came to see me, three young girls and three young men. Three young men were quite sheepish. The three girls had the advantage of having had a longer relationship with each other, so they made the pace. And they said, we want you to conduct a joint wedding. And we're looking at a large house that we're all going to buy and live together. And I looked at these three men. <laughs> One just had to say, Lord, a word of wisdom, please. And you know, the Lord gave me a word of wisdom. And I managed with a straight face to look at these six and just say, right, certainly, I'll conduct the wedding, provided each of you makes the promises five times to the other five. And they looked at me. And they looked at each other. I said, well, if you're going to live together. And so they said, well, we'd like to think about it a bit. <laughs> So they went away. They came back about a week later quite sheepishly and they said, well, we're not quite so sure now. So finally I said, well, look, why don't you get married separately and live the first year separately and then if the Lord still says come together, then buy your house and come together. 
They never did come together, actually. They're all three very happily married. And they realized that it was a human intuition and prompting. Oh, how necessary a word of wisdom is to be able to say a thing that just clears up a difficult situation that breaks through a seemingly impossible circumstance. Would you like that gift? Is that the gift you're going to go away from this morning praying for? Lord, give me a word of wisdom. Maybe you need that word very desperately right now. A word of knowledge, that's not the knowledge that comes from books or having a big library or having a theological degree. It's an immediate access to the encyclopedia of God's mind. To know something that only he knows. Again, can I give you a very simple illustration from ordinary life? So ordinary that you could dismiss it as coincidence. I was sitting in my study preparing a sermon and reached out for the telephone, picked it up, dialed a number for a lady who had, I'd not telephoned in 18 months. And when she answered, she said, what do you want? I said, I don't know. She said, isn't it marvelous? I've been trying to get hold of you desperately for 25 minutes and the phone's out of order and I couldn't get through and I'm in desperate need. And so I just sat by the phone and I said, Lord, get me through to Mr. Paulson. And she said, it took 25 seconds to get through when I'd wasted 25 minutes trying to get through myself. That's what I mean by knowledge. Just a word of knowledge. God knows everything about everybody. How helpful it is. Some of you have ministered to me in the last few months like this. I had one crisis, early hours of the morning, Thursday morning. How thrilled I was on Sunday, the following Sunday morning when one of you right here now said the Lord woke me up in the early hours of Thursday morning to pray for you. Knowledge. To have the knowledge that God has so that you're able to minister a need. It's supernatural knowledge. You can't get it out of a book. It's a gift. The gift of faith. All of us have faith if we're Christians, but there's a special gift that can go way beyond. I remember the day it was exercised in this church. I remember the church meeting when we first knew of the cost of this building, which was just way beyond our reach. Thousands and thousands of pounds. And I remember that church meeting when somebody in our church was given the gift of faith that the pastor didn't have. And I remember a man getting up, and he's probably here now, and you may remember that memorable meeting, when he got up and said, let's believe that God will give us all the money by the time the building opened. Do you remember that? We were then talking in terms of paying it off over seven or ten years. Someone in the church was given the special gift of faith, and it lifted the rest of us, and I admit freely, my first reaction was, no, that's impossible. Now, let's be reasonable, let's be realistic. But God rebuked, and the gift of faith provided this building, which you now meet. But it was a gift given to one man in the whole church, for the church, to lift our spirits and to help us to believe that such things could happen. The gift of healing, I hardly need to talk to you about this. There are those of you listening to me now who'd be in your grave at this moment, but for this gift. This is not a gift of speech. Though there's usually speech connected with it, it's more the hands that are used here. But God can use your hands and give this lovely gift. As I've said, I'll tell you tonight how it's been used by a two-month-old Christian towards my wife. The gift of prophecy. I don't believe that's the gift of preaching. I'm teaching you this morning. I'm not prophesying. Unless God gave me a direct word by immediate inspiration for you that you needed to have. But it seems as if God loves to give the gift of prophecy to those who are not preachers. Isn't that a lovely thought? To those who can't string words together, to those who don't feel able to give a long address. And God will sometimes give a lovely word of prophecy. I think of one lovely example in a prayer meeting, an all-night prayer meeting we had here. Again, the people concerned may be here. I don't know. But there was a girl sitting in that prayer meeting and she knew that the Lord wanted to speak through her and she wasn't given to public speaking and she was frightened and she waited and waited I think waited a couple of hours and nothing happened because she wasn't willing to open her mouth and start speaking because she didn't know what she was going to say and she was frightened and God had a word of prophecy to give us through her and so isn't God wonderful what a sense of humor he has there was a young man sitting behind this young lady and he got up in that prayer meeting with his hands on the back of the chair in front. And he was a bit nervous, so he was shaking like this. 
And he prophesied, and the prophecy was, say what you have to say. <laughs> and the girl was sitting right on the chair. <laughs> and if ever there was a direct word of prophecy, it was there. <laughs> and you see how a word of prophecy to one person ministered to another who then ministered to those of us gathered in that prayer meeting. How God sits in heaven and smiles our reluctance to let ourselves be used. Word of prophecy, Paul said, I, I, I would that you all spoke in tongues, but even more to prophesy. That's a higher gift. It is immediately helpful to the Church of Christ. It shows that God is not just one who spoke 2,000 years ago, but that he speaks today. And that not only does God speak generally to a lost world, he speaks particularly to a given situation. Not far from here there was an Anglican communion and it was going through the usual order of service and it came to the collect for the royal family, you know, God bless Queen Elizabeth, His Royal Highness Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Charles and so on. And immediately after the collect for the royal family a lady prophesied in this Anglican communion and she prophesied that God had a special concern for Prince Charles at that moment. And so they prayed for Prince Charles. About a year later, my wife handed me one of her women's magazines and it was an article on Prince Charles, one of these chatty news articles, you know. And in it I read something that immediately linked up because I was able to date it back. At the very time of that prophecy, Prince Charles was in the outback in Australia. Do you remember when he went to Timbertop School? And on that Sunday, do you know where he was? He was out among the Aborigines. And he had found a tiny little corrugated iron shed in which some Aborigines of Australia were meeting to worship God. And the Spirit was moving among them. And Charles wrote home to his mother, the Queen. If this is real Christianity, I can understand why it spread in the early days. Just a word of prophecy at an Anglican communion service. God is revealing things and doing things. Just building up his body. Discernment how much that is needed to know if this is of the flesh or if it's of God or if it's of Satan. Some of you in the congregation know Billy Richards, knew Billy Richards, and you'll see him again in glory. He's now gone to glory. I thought of him when I drove through Slough this week. Billy Richards was a man with the gift of discernment. And if somebody got up in that church in Slough, which was a unique church, somebody got up and, and, and began to act in the flesh, dear Pastor Richards would get up and he'd say, Brother, that's in the flesh and you know it, so sit down and be quiet and let the service get on. He was so down to earth, so realistic. For Billy, who was so matter of fact, it had to be the real thing or not at all. How you need the gift of discernment. Many of our problems of guidance are due to the lack of discernment. The gift of tongues, I wish I could erase that word from every translation of the Bible. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for saying languages. That's precisely what it said originally. That's what it should always say. There's nothing strange about languages. After all, God gave them all and he knows them all. He doesn't find it any more difficult to understand a Chinaman praying than listening to someone in Guildford. And the God who made these languages, in his infinite mercy, wants to set us free from the limits of our own language. And there are strict limits. How many of us get stuck in prayer and praise because we can't think of what to say next? And God wants to take the brakes off your prayer and praise. And as I said, we past Sunday night, it seems so sensible and so obvious to give this gift first to beginners. It's a jolly good one for starters. Because in fact, this gift, if a person is full to overflowing, this little aperture here is the natural overflow. And if you're full of supernatural power, you would expect the overflow to demonstrate an ability to do something that otherwise you couldn't do. And most of us are hopeless at language. I manage English with northern A's. My speech betrayeth me. I can say one sentence of French, je ne parle pas français, which gets me by. 
and then I'm just about stuck apart from a, a smattering of Greek. But oh, the Lord wants to set free, and on the day of Pentecost, it's as if he wanted to reverse Babel, which had driven men apart and caused confusion and misunderstanding because of different languages. It's as if God was saying, I want to bring you all together, and you can express together, I want to reverse it all. This gift is not given to preach with. If it were, it would save missionaries an awful lot of time, and Bible translators too. But it's not given to preach with, it's given to pray and praise with, it's given to address men, not God. I mean God, not men, given to address heaven, not earth. And how much we need to address heaven. Once you're set free to address God, you'll be set free to address men. Our witnessing, I'm afraid, is directly related in proportion to our worship. If I'm free in worship, I'm free in witness. If I'm not free in worship, I'm not free in witness. If I can't talk to God about his mighty works, then I certainly can't talk to anyone else about them. Finally, the gift of interpretation which means not the ability that some of the gentlemen here this morning have, knowing two languages of translating one into the other, but the ability to know more deeply. Dave Foster is here, straight from Czechoslovakia. He's been there with our dear brother, the pastor whom we all pray for and know. And I remember preaching uh, with uh, the pastor translating. Were you there that evening, Dave? You remember it. Well, he's, he's got a good command of English, but it's not perfect. And in private conversation, you sometimes have to say a thing differently to get it through. And I wondered how we'd get on in translation, or in interrupting as we call it. <laughs> and so we stood up, and I said to him afterwards, you know, you were ahead of me in some of the things I said. <laughs> I sensed in my spirit that he was saying something ahead of me before I said it, though he was interpreting. And we were just speaking together. And I asked him about this afterwards, and he said, well, I just pray for the gift of interpretation. And he said, I knew what you were saying before you said it. So I could just express it. And so to the mechanics of putting one language into another was added the gift of interpretation. So the Holy Spirit was communicating mind to mind. Lovely gift. All of these gifts are in the hands of God. It's as he wills. In the last analysis, he decides who has what. But that doesn't mean we can't ask and can't desire. It would be an utter contradiction if we simply said, well, God is totally arbitrary, he's capricious, he will just simply pick out people with a pin and give them gifts and there's nothing we can do about it. If that's the situation, then brethren, you cannot possibly do any good by earnestly desiring any of these gifts. But you see, we're dealing not with a machine, we're dealing with a person. And he takes note of our desires. He decides, but he decides often because we desire. It's his decision, but it can be our desire. In the nine gifts I've listed, think for a moment. Now, which of those nine would you like to have for this fellowship? Or for your home church if you come from somewhere else? Which of those nine would you like to receive for someone else? Don't go away this morning without deciding. And how earnestly do you desire them? If you really want them, you'll go away and you'll ask and you'll ask and you'll ask until God either says yes or no. He will decide, but oh, we should desire. Lord, I'd love that gift. Not for myself, not for my status, not for my reputation, not for my power. I just love that gift because I believe the fellowship needs it. And so I earnestly desire it. I want it. I want to be the one to pass that gift on to the fellowship. And God decides, but he looks at whether we desire. And if we don't want it, I can tell you quite certainly, you will never have a gift that you don't want, because the Lord is a gentleman. I have never known him force anything on me. I've never known him force anything on anyone else. He can use some subtle pressure, but he never forces. And in fact, we never will have a gift until we are prepared to use it. Now, won't we have problems with a lot of gifts and a lot of different gifts given to a lot of people? Isn't it much safer to try and find a minister with all the gifts and then let him do it? I saw two pictures. I believe the navigators had these two pictures of two kinds of church. They both showed a rowing boat, and in one boat, there was a man with a, a collar back to front standing in the rear of the boat with a big punting pole like this, and sitting in the boat were rows of people in rows of seats cheering him on. 
and he was pulling away like this. And then the, the other picture showed another boat and there was a man with a, a dog collar on in this boat. He was in the same position. But he was urging on all the people sitting in the seats who each had an oar. And this boat was flying past the other and it just said, which church is yours? It was an American told me, and I'm sure it's apocryphal, that churches in America, when they're looking for a new pastor, they look for a good preacher, good visitor, good administrator, and a good youth leader. If they find a man with one gift, well, they'll just stay the way they are. If they find a man with two, they'll grow. If they find a man with three, they'll soon be the main church in town. Find a man with all four, don't touch him, he's a freak. Now, <laughs> I'm quite sure that's wrong. But the tragedy is, that when we've lost a minister, we look for another minister who will have all the gifts of the last one, plus a few more. And there's a very short market in these archangels, I assure you. It's not God's plan. And it's no use calling a man, then discovering what gifts he hasn't, and then comparing it with someone else who had them. No use. What God is waiting for the church to do is to say, Lord, I can see our minister hasn't got this gift. Make me the one that brings it into the fellowship. Give me the passion to be the channel, to supplement the ministry, to be a minister, until every member of your church is, is not passenger but crew, until we are sharing gifts with each other. But won't there be trouble? Yes, there will. Won't some people develop superiority complexes? Yes, they will. Won't others develop inferiority complexes? Yes, they will. Won't those who feel inferior start separating from the superior? Yes, I'm afraid they will. Unless there is love. I'm afraid when gifts are given, superiority and inferiority complexes develop rapidly. On the one hand are those who say, well, I'm not needed now. I'm just a little gift and they don't need me. On the other hand are those who have a big gift and who say, I don't need them. And the answer to it is all in one four-letter word, body, body. When you forget that word, then gifts destroy, divide, break down, don't do any good. I've been corrected by my family. Sorry, there's another reference. Some children correct their fathers when their fathers happen to mention things in the pulpit. And I think last Sunday I said that the ear was far inferior to the eye because the ear only did two things. It heard and it was somewhere to hang your spectacles on. Well now, they pointed out that in fact your ear keeps you balanced, which is very important, and I admit that. But I still think the eye can do much more. It's got a physical function, it's got a social function, it's got a spiritual function. Now the problem with the body of Christ is that the ear can talk and the eye can talk. Getting a bit crazy this picture, isn't it? But this is the biblical picture. And the ear says, I'm, because I'm not the eye and I can just hold spectacles up, the body doesn't need me. Did you ever feel like that? Did you ever feel your little gift was not noticed by people and that the church could manage well without you? Then listen, Paul says, you are a necessary part of the body doesn't matter if your gift is a tiny little one. In fact, with our physical bodies, the more vulnerable, the more important the organ, the more hidden it is from public view. Again, it is a tragedy that the Christian world focuses attention on people with public gifts. I'm afraid I suppose that's inevitable in the course of events. But some of the most valuable ministries practiced in this fellowship are those that are never seen in public. And sometimes the most reproductive organs are those that are hidden. And sometimes the Christians who win more for Christ than others are the quiet people behind the scenes. And you hardly know their reproductive organs, but they're operating that way. <clears throat> There's no need to feel inferior, nor is there any need to feel superior, because you're an I. Or take the hands and the feet. Your hands can do so much. What marvelous things hands are. How you miss them. The Lord showed me that when this one was out of action for those six months, and boy, how you miss them. And they're so expressive. They can soothe, they can comfort, they can challenge, they can defend, they can express my feet. Somebody has noticed that my feet dance a bit during preaching. 
I suppose it's just nerves. It's not intended to help you, so I'm sorry if, if it distracts you. My feet have only one function at the moment, that's to hold me up. But they are very necessary. My hands mustn't develop a superiority complex over my feet. Because my feet take my hands where they need to go. And it is this concept of gifts of the Spirit operating together as a body so that people don't compare one person with another. The only inferiority you have a right to have is if you have no gift at all and no ministry at all because you're out of God's will and you should be worried about that. I'm not worried if some people receive gifts of the Spirit and some don't and those that don't feel inferior. I'm not in the slightest worried. Let them be challenged to the only form of coveting which a Christian is commanded to have. I am not to covet my neighbor's house, his swimming pool, his two cars. I'm not to covet any of these things. What I am to covet is spiritual gifts. And if you haven't got them, then I don't mind if you feel inferior. You go to the Lord. But if you have got one, and it's not a very public one, and it's not a very spectacular one, oh, I beg you, don't feel inferior. Because you're probably a more important, important part of the body. And we should care for you more. And if you suffer, we should suffer. And if you rejoice, we should be glad. I wonder which is more difficult of those two things, do you think? I think it's harder to rejoice when others rejoice, isn't it? Especially if you're going through a bad patch yourself. Awfully hard to shout hallelujah for someone else when you're feeling rotten, isn't it? But that's a body. And that's why, in a sense, I would say to you this. If one person in this fellowship is given a spiritual gift, that gift has been given to all of us. Because we are one body. And if you say that gift has been given to her and not to me, in a sense you're saying I'm not part of the body. Because if health comes to part of my body when I got the use of this hand back in January, I didn't say, well, bully for that hand. I wish the rest of me was feeling as good as that hand. I said, no. I said, I've got it back. I've got it back. When my tooth aches, I don't say, you see that tooth there? It's going through a tough time at the moment. I, I say, I've got toothache. I've got toothache. This is the concept not them and me, but us, the body of Christ. I've got this. And so if one member is in trouble, I've got trouble. And if one member is given a gift of the Spirit, I've got a gift of the Spirit. That will renew your optimism. And I think it will help you to receive gifts yourself if you can learn to thank God for the gifts he's already given to you through others. Well, I think I must be drawing to a close. I'm just sharing with you a few new thoughts from this chapter. I've missed out the most important verse. It's controversial. I have not yet met any translation that just leaves me totally satisfied. Verse 13. How do these gifts appear? How is God able to give them? Well, he can only give them to those who are in the body. That's the first thing. He can't give them outside his body. They are functions of his body. That lovely story again of the little girl who was asked shortly after her conversion, how will you keep it up? It's only a flash in the pan. You won't be able to go on being a Christian. She said, he is able to keep me. No one will pluck me out of his hand. And her questioner said, but what if you should slip through his fingers? She said, I can't. I am one of the fingers. I am one of the fingers. You've got to be part of the body of Christ before he can use you in gifts. But that's not all. Do you remember the prophet Ezekiel carried into the valley of dry bones, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones. It was a graveyard. They were the bones of people who died in the long trek of slaves across the desert into captivity. And he saw bones. And then he saw the graveyard turn into something else. And the bones came together and the flesh came on the bones. But he still only had a mortuary. It had a little more potential than a graveyard, but it was still a mortuary. And then Son of Man prophesied to the wind, let God blow, let God blow. And the bodies moved and stood upright. A mighty army. Now we've got a fair number of bodies here this morning. 
But does God see us as a mortuary or an army? Something more is needed than being in the body, and I'll tell you what it is. I give you a simple translation. Paul says we were drenched in Holy Spirit. And we got drunk in Holy Spirit. In other words, we got soaked through inside and out. We were drenched outside and we drank in. And both verbs are in a particular Greek tense, which means something that happened once. They're not a continuous thing that's being referred to here. It's something that happened once that just drenched a person. Now the big controversy that's on at the moment, and I find it sad because it's dividing Christians, is to whether Paul's referring to a person's conversion or something that should happen later. My answer is, I don't care one brass button when it happens, as long as it happens. If it happens at someone's conversion, hallelujah. But if they weren't drenched then and got drunk in the spirit then, then it can happen later. God isn't so worried about timetable. It's our theology that gets all worried about that. He wants people who are drenched in the spirit and who have got drunk on the spirit. That's what he needs. If you don't like the term baptized in the spirit, then use drenched in the spirit. I'm quite happy. It's a better translation anyway. Drenched drinking. Don't get drunk with wine, and many of us have been brought up too respectable ever to do that, and so we hardly know what it is to be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine, for therein is debauchery, excess, wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. Sing and make melody in your heart. It's talking about being drunk with God. The Reverend John Wesley, the great revivalist of the 18th century, said, Give me 100 men intoxicated with God and we can turn England upside down. They did. They saved this country from the French Revolution. God intoxicated men. So I don't care whether this happened at your conversion or later. The important thing is, has it happened? Could Paul say, you were drenched in one spirit? You were made to drink of one spirit? Because that's when things begin to happen. And the fact that in many Christians' lives, these things never do happen. Would I think cause us to ask very lovingly, did you ever get drenched? We're not talking now about the Spirit dwelling. We're talking about the Spirit drenching. We're not talking about taking a sip of the Spirit. We're talking about being drunk in the Spirit. Without any hangover. Just blessing. And so we've looked at 1 Corinthians 12, and I ask you very seriously as your pastor, will you please go away from this morning's service having decided on one gift that you're going to ask and go on asking for, for the fellowship, that you might be the channel to communicate it, that you might be set free from the inhibitions that would hold you back from sharing it, that you might be wide open to the Lord and wide open to his people and just become a channel of his grace until his body in this place is built up strong and pure and powerful and people know that God's alive. He's not dead. He's not even reported sick. He's alive and well. Let us pray.